Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we are changing the mental health narrative, bringing hope and solutions. Here's your host, Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. Jason Shires is a certified psychotherapist and certified transformative coach who has gone through the full journey from childhood trauma to addictions, mental health problems, jails, and psychiatric care, on to a 12-step recovery and becoming a professional helping others. His story is painful and eye-opening. It shows how the system pathologizes normal, intelligent human response to tragic life circumstances. It also shows how there's really a way out for everyone when people learn to discover their own true natural wisdom. Well, Jason, welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning. Afternoon, where you are. Yeah, afternoon. Very gray. I'm wet now. (laughs) But you're familiar with that. That's something that's not new to you over there. It's typical in the summer to rain or something. (laughs) Well, I was hoping you could start us off today by letting us know a little bit about how you got into the work you do and what drives your passion for it. Yeah, sure. I will. Um, I know we talked about this, and I don't want it, to. It's such a long story with so many facets. It's like, and I try and keep it as short as possible because, yeah, it can go on forever. <laughs> I guess like my story started, you know, with a with a, a trauma, a tragic event, with the loss of my dad. He was killed in an accident when I was young, when I was just five years old, and um, yeah, he went out and he didn't come back. Basically, the police came. You know, and that was the, the what I would uh, coin the start. You know, a cosmic, a cosmic and catastrophic loss, um, particularly because in my uh, diving into trauma in later years, I saw that there was very little connection with my mother. So it was kind of like the da- my dad was the connection in my life. You know, and um, so it was very catastrophic that loss and I was overwhelmed as a traumatic event you know and and from there on in I I lost both parents basically because the other parent couldn't cope um so I was if anyone asked me to describe my childhood I would say uh work it out for yourself that was what it was you know wow starting at five huh yeah (laughs) you know for healthy development as I'm sure you know you know nurturing and love and and guidance is required in abundance, you know, for children. And, and there was pretty much zero, you know. So, um, and and one of the things that I talk about in my work today is is resilience and innate intelligence, built in wisdom, you know. And it's like children in adversity and trauma always find a way to cope, you know. And it just so happens that coping mechanism may well have been pathologized by somebody along the way, and there may be a whole label and bunch of opinions and theories about what it is and what's wrong and how to fix it. So my innate intelligence picked up food as a comfort, as a loyal companion, as a friend, as a coping mechanism, and uh, and then behavioral, being off key behaviorally, being withdrawn um, to the point of being diagnosed with depression and medicated when I was nine years old. Wow. Um, So that was my entry into the psychiatric system and perhaps um, 30 plus years of diagnosis and psychiatric intervention and um, chaos, you know, so to speak, medicated and different things. Um, And from there, things just went from bad to worse, really. You know, it was just like my coping mechanism was, was withdrawal. It was creating chaos. It was committing crime. It was stealing from home. It was... Uh, being completely unruly and off key and stuffing as much food in my mouth as I could, you know, as a, as a way of coping with this, what seemed like being dealt a bad hand, a horrific life, you know, put on diet pills at 12 years old from a private doctor to curb my appetite because I couldn't stop eating. Cause all people could see was the manifestation in my body, the external, the external results of my coping mechanism, which was ballooning in weight, you know, I found drugs as a teenager at 13 years old. Um, I hadn't even, I drank alcohol once or twice, but it didn't really do the same thing for me as when I found heroin. And that was my escape uh, from myself. I can remember the first time I ever took drugs and it was like, oh my God, this is what I'd been searching for my whole life, you know? And it was true. It was what I'd been searching for my whole life. It was peace and respite for myself. Yeah, numb out from the pain, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 in a way, you know, my mind went quiet, my thoughts quietened down, my pain, my suffering dissipated in those moments of taking drugs. I felt a sense of ease and comfort, you know, and it's like, so of course I attributed that to the drugs, you know, I didn't realize what was really going on at that time. And, uh, and a, a friend said to me at that point, I can remember where I was, whose house I was at that day, you know, and he, he said to me, look at you, you're addicted already. You know, cause I was like, I was so excited, you know, cause I'd found a, found a, like for the first time since I'd been thinking, which was probably about seven years or something, you know, and, and in pain, suffering, overweight, withdrawn, isolated, medicated, in and out of psychiatric interventions. For the first time I'd found something And I was only 13 at this point, 14 at this point. For the first time, I'd kind of found myself feeling okay, like having a break from myself or being able to just relax. It's like, it was like lifting the invisible rucksack off your back full of rocks, you know? And and from there, I already knew how to commit crime. I already knew, uh, I was, you know, I'd been doing that for, for a lot since I could remember. So it just made sense to commit crime, to sell things, to make money, to buy drugs, you know? So I went straight into that criminal um, world, you know, to the point that progressed into organized crime and stuff, you know, and as I got a little bit older and um, in and out of jails and institutions, um for crimes just always related to drugs you know like committing crime to get money to take more drugs um i was already homeless by that but as a young teenager um my family didn't really want anything to do with me because they couldn't leave anything valuable around you know because i would take it um and i guess my mum was having a horrific experience she just didn't know what to do with me you know um and in a in a efforts to love me in many ways you know she tried all sorts of things that were probably contributing factors to my bitterness at the time and my withdrawal and my feeling separate and alone in the world so i mean that carried on and i mean by 23 i was already had 10 years of that chaos you know in and out of jails institutions i was so tired even shoplifting for uh joints of meat you know just to get enough money to get a small amount of drugs to feel normal just kind of got to the point where i was really tired you know i was tired i couldn't go out i hid myself i wore scarves and hats and hoods and things you know because i just got arrested every time i went out for something different um so i'd try and be in my in my own mind i looked kind of inconspicuous you know but i probably stood out like a sore thumb is the truth you know stealing joints of meat or packets of bacon or blocks of cheese in the supermarket just to find a small amount of money to feel normal you know and that that was where it was at the end it wasn't glamorous or or extravagant you know it was desperate and it was empty living in a homeless shelter you know that's that's where it ended up i went to rehab i went to 12-step rehab i knew nothing about 12 steps and i knew nothing about psychology or the mind or the human experience or our spiritual nature i knew nothing of those things And I was very naive. So when I went to rehab, they said to me, you've got a disease. It's called addiction. Uh, We can't explain it. It's an unexplainable phenomena. You've got it for the rest of your life. And you need to do these things every single day in order to to be okay. And I just went, okay. No, okay. No, like no question. Uh, You can't drink ever again. Okay. You can't take drugs ever again. Okay. You know, I'll do it. Because I was desperate. I mean, I was desperate. I was homeless. I owned a bin bag full of clothes. That was it. So I would have believed anything that like gave me a bit of freedom, you know. Um, and and what happened was I stopped taking drugs and I went straight back to food. Food was a primary addiction for me from when I lost my dad. It was a a, a very soothing, comforting experience, and I gained kind of like a hundred pounds in about. At 12 weeks in rehab, you know, in weight. Because I was stealing food out of bins. I was sneaking down into the kitchen at night. I was uh, watching every single person eating in the dining room and stealing the food that was left over on the plates and stashing it in my room and eating it. So I just really, it was what I call whack-a-mole addiction, you know. I'd stopped, I'd stopped with drugs and alcohol, but I just picked up something else to replace it with. And uh, everyone's cheering you on, saying how great you're doing, not using one day at a time, not taking drugs, but like little do they know, you're sat in the room binging and purging and uh, feeling desperately empty and looking at yourself in the mirror, wanting to cut bits of yourself off, hating on your body. You know, it's kind of like 
and uh most guys that I know that over the years that got clean, they were kind of getting getting clean like at like 120 pounds, 130 pounds. And within a few months, they were 250, you know, 200, oh. 250. They're all like piling on the weight. So it seems a very common thing. And it's laughed about, you know, it's, it's not taken that seriously. And not all men feel that bad about their body, but I was desperate, you know, it really. I mean, I have a, a long story with the food addiction stuff in, in my recovery um recovery so to speak from drugs and alcohol in the first 15 years i had seven cosmetic operations trying to remove skin and parts of my body and stuff two of them in in third world countries um because it was cheaper it's, it's, it's like you can see the desperation in that you know like really trying to um go to sleep and wake up thin and happy you know it's like it was there in me it was desperate that if i could just change the outside of myself to fix the inside that was just one of the many stories like while i was going to 12 steps training to be a therapist and uh desperately empty inside you know seeking relationships looking through gambling and pornography and even crime in in recovery so to speak you know i call it recovery because that's what we called it but it, doesn't really look like that much recovery. I wasn't taking drugs and alcohol, but that was it. You know, I was right. doing everything else. There was um, no healing happening. There was no healing. You know, I was not willing, not prepared, and I had no guidance either. You know, yeah, no one I had, had no ever, idea. No, yeah. Yeah. No one had ever. I mean, I heard the term, it's the answers are within, but I think the people saying it didn't actually know what it meant either. Exactly. You know? um, and the 12 step guidance came via people that were still lost themselves, you know? And it's like, it, 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 in a way it saved my life. I'm always grateful for the 12 steps and the people that I met and the journey that I went on, you know? But in another way, it was kind of like the blind leading the blind, you know, at the time. Um, yeah, it can be. So I, I, I always had this, one thing I always talk about is the feeling of seeking, you know? And, and everyone used to say to me that I was around, you know, you need to stop seeking. You need to stop seeking things because what you're seeking is your problem. You know, if you stop seeking, seeking things, seeking people, seeking women, seeking relationships, seeking sex, seeking, seeking, if you stop that, then you'll be okay. You know, it's kind of like, but that just came from, you know, what I call good advice, which is useless to everyone. You know, it's kind of like, because it comes from people who don't know themselves, this good advice. Everyone's got some good advice for you, you know. And um, seeking now today, I see it as my intuition of home, my, my knowing of home, my knowing that there's a place of peace available, my knowing that there's a, a respite within myself. But I just didn't know where to look, you know, and I just kept turning over every stone that I came to. And that was like my, my training in the world of psychology. You know, it's like qualification after qualification in um in transactional analysis in psychodynamic therapy in person-centered counseling in cbt in nlp i then went on and did all of tony robbins i went and did the hoffman process and the landmark forum and uh silent meditations i read books and all sorts of stuff that would looked great at the time but were meaningless to me i didn't really understand the depth or the profundity of what they were pointing to so I just kept suffering, you know, and even when I was a therapist, it's like I used to describe it as we could sit in the dark together, but none of us knew where the light switch was. Right. You know, I was good at sitting in the dark with people. I became really present and attuned to people's pain because I'd become so attuned to my own pain by, by the experiential trainings that I'd done. But I didn't know where joy and contentment and peace of mind where they were. I didn't even understand what they were myself. My own life was still a front on the outside. The character that I call Jason that exists in my own mind, you know, was, was leading the way, looking good, you know, and, and showing up in a way that people believed he was doing well. But the internal experience of myself was horrific, was painful, was, was withdrawn and was uh, resigned. This was it. You know, I didn't think I was ever going to find peace, you know, it's like, but there was still that little pilot, what I call the pilot light, you know, the pilot light was still on, like you get in the boiler, you know, even when the gas is off, you can see the little flame going, when you turn the gas on, it lights up, like the pilot light was, was there, because the pilot light is on for all people, always, you know, there's always a little pilot light, even sometimes when the flame is low. Um, so I'd, I'd, um, 
ended up, I found this um, course online. I'd, I'd, <laughs> it was quite funny because I'd been in this Tony Robbins thing where we shared resources to watch videos and um, someone gave me a login for Hay House Radio and there was this course in there called The Path of Effortless Change. And my life had been anything but effortless. In fact, it felt like walking in quicksand ever since I'd started thinking, you know. And uh, at this point, I'm probably 42, 43, you know, and I, and I found this name of this course, The Path of Effortless Change. I thought, whatever that is, I need to know what it is, because anything effortless sounds better than what I've got, you know. And um, Michael was sharing, we talked about earlier about the three principles, which was the discoveries of Sydney Banks. That's what Michael was sharing about. But I didn't know that at the time. I just listened to this guy talking, you know, he didn't really talk about. What was his much. name? Michael Neal. Okay. Um, He's a quite a famous coach in Los Angeles. And um, uh, I listened to it like with this, there was something in me that resonated deeply with what was being talked about. And I couldn't put my, my intellectual mind, my educated mind couldn't really reconcile what it was. You know, it didn't make, it didn't make particular intellectual sense, but there was a, a resonance within me of this feeling of connection to what was being shared. And it was a deeper truth about the human experience, you know, a deeper truth of our true nature, a deeper truth of our innate resilience and wisdom that I had kind of uh, didn't make too much sense to me, to my mind, to my small mind at that point. But like there was something in me that thought, I've got to know more about this. You know, I have to know more about it. And um, I ended up in L.A. at his house, at Michael's house for a, what they called an intensive that was about the most relaxed thing you could ever do, you know, like just two days of sitting, listening and talking and sharing stuff, you know, but I had a, uh, what you might call a, you know, I don't believe that human beings get enlightened. I think that they just discover the truth of who they are, you know, and that they're never not that, you know, it's just covered up by the, by the veil of pathologized normal human response to adversity and stories that we tell ourselves. And somewhere in those two days, that's what I realized, you know, I realized the creation of my own mind, the story, or, or I was the lead character in my own mind in the movie playing in my own mind, but that wasn't who I was, you know, it wasn't the truth of me. I realized that there's part of me that had always been perfectly okay, that had never been damaged, couldn't be damaged, you know, and I had this real profound kind of experiential feeling of bliss and peace. And I, and I knew, I just knew in that Sounds moment. Sounds like quite a shift. Oh, it was massive because afterwards I was going, well, I haven't got more money, haven't got any relationship, haven't lost weight. It's kind of like nothing's actually changed. What's going on? You know, and it's like, and I was just sat in this, uh, so at the back of this Airbnb in, in Woodland Hills in Los Angeles. And I was just sat there feeling this beautiful feeling, listening to the birds. And, and it was in the evening, you know, and I was just sat there on this little swing and I was just, I still feel the, the, the joy of being free, you know, in that moment, and just thinking this was this was what I've been seeking, you know, it was like it was a discovery of myself, you know, a realization that I'm okay. And that I'd spent my whole life escaping from my own mind, you know, not that there wasn't trauma, not that there, that's not a thing or anything like that. But every day, I made up this story of a victim in my own mind, you know, it's kind of like pretty much from as soon as I started waking, my thinking about myself, and then I'd escape the very suffering that I'd created, you know, in the same day, and uh, realized that there was this transient no energy noise that we call thought passing through my mind on a daily basis that didn't have any inherent power of its own, you know, it was just noise. And it's kind of like I was free to pay attention to it or not, you know, and I, it, I just think after that, the noise in my mind just died down, you know, it's just kind of literally became like a, an old radio in the background. Um, and, 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 and even today, someone asked me the other day, I had a client the other day, and he's, I said, you know, I just have no negative thinking about myself. I just don't remember having that same old stuff that I woke up to every single day, you know, like absolute, complete and utter devastation and negativity. It's kind of like, it would have been horrible to be me if that thinking was your only relationship to yourself, you know? It's kind of like, and that's what I, what I lived in the feeling of, you know? And 
uh, I'll pause here, but like, I guess from there, you know, life changed unrecognizably. I mean, like just to put a, a practical um, seeing of the impact of that experience, you know, I never had psychiatric care again after that. I, I stopped going to 12 step meetings after 22 years. Um, I haven't been since, you know, I, I, um, I called my therapist or I emailed my therapist of seven years and I was very picky about therapists, you know, cause I knew a lot cause I'd been through a lot of trainings myself. And I said, Oh, the next session will be the last one. I don't need this anymore. You know, it was like all these things. I knew that I couldn't practice as a therapist myself. I didn't know what I would do or how I would share my work at that point. But all these things were so clear to me. You know, I was just absolutely certain that my life had changed. Um, so in, in a way that I'd never experienced before. And um, yeah, that's kind of been the, and since then it's been an evolution of that deepening and seeing of the human experience, you know, it's like of the, of the mind body connection and the spiritual truth of who we are and how that plays out. And that's kind of what informs my work today, you know, and, and, and it's evolved, you know, it's evolved since that moment, which was about seven, six, seven years ago. Um, in many ways, you know, but that was, that was the start of now, you know? So you said you, uh, as soon as that happened, you realized you couldn't do therapy as a therapist anymore, and you didn't want to continue doing therapy as a client anymore. So what have you done since then? Where has your work gone? I've kind of come back, you know, at first, I kind of thought that spirituality was superior to therapy. I heard this a lot from other people, you know, it's kind of like, oh, spirituality, you don't need to do techniques, you don't need to do anything, you're okay, you've always been okay, you just need to see that, you know, it's, it's of the mind. And um, so I first of all thought, I think because I'd suffered for so long, I really thought that there was this thing, this way, I call it the way, you know, there was this way of finding true peace and bliss on a permanent basis. But somewhere along the line, I kind of realized that being in the human experience was not about um, not experiencing any emotions or any feelings, you know, that you don't like. It wasn't that, you know. So now it's kind of like a, I've done many years of spiritual explorations in non-duality, in the three principal stuff that we talked about, in other um, spiritual traditions, practices, meditations, and then um, come back to trauma work, you know, like of the body and the somatic experience. So now it's like a, my years of all that stuff blended together, you know, it's my own kind of holistic approach to well being that, um, that I see for myself, my evolution of myself and, and, and what, what keeps me sane and free and joyful. And that's kind of how I work with others, you know. And so do you work just one on one? Do you have group settings? What What's the format you use? Yeah, both groups and one to one um, different things. I'm teaching on some other people's programs as a kind of as a teacher and my own addiction stuff and one to one as a coach as well, you know, so it's all, all sometimes with couples, sometimes with individuals, sometimes with young people and often with adults too, you know, men and women. So you mentioned being in California with Mike O'Neill and at this thing that you called intensive and then you described it as like the most relaxing thing you could do for two days. Yeah. Are you aware of what allowed the shift? Do you remember yeah. anything it's about great... that dynamic or process that was key for you? I'm glad you looked there. It's a great question. And often when I'm teaching or training on a group or something it's one of the things that i start with because i feel like while you can't give someone an insight you can somewhat create some conditions and 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 set up some parameters that would help people see beyond the intellectual thinking mind you know often i think for me because I was so educated, you know, led the way with my brain, you know, I led the way with what I knew and what I thought I knew, ego fueled brain intelligence, you know, um, there was no way for me of ever knowing that there was something beyond that, you know, that there was a that, that filter, every bit of information ran through that filter, you know, the typical brain processing filler, is it useful? 
shall I store it for later? Is it like something I know? Have I heard this before? Is it good or is it bad? You know, that's what's going on in this really fast receiving and processing of information in the brain. But Michael said to me, I was sat there um, with my notebook and uh, it cost a lot of money and I was really <laughs> angry. You know, it's kind of like I was thinking to myself, all these letters after my name, all these qualifications, what can this guy teach me? You know, it's kind of like, and like it was expensive to get there. A friend of mine had given me the money, like I didn't even have the money. So I was so grateful for that. And I was thinking money's worth, you know, how do I get my money's worth here? I'd been at Tony Robbins, 18 hour days, five days a week. And this guy just said, we're going to have two hours for lunch. And he was already half an hour late for starting at 10 o'clock, you know, and I was getting more and more angry thinking, we need this time, you know, because I need to get the information. Fill me up. Yep. Fix me. Yeah. Yeah. And he just said to me, I remember he said, can you just be here? And I thought, you know, like now looking back at that just simple statement, no one had ever invited me to be present in the present moment with what is, you know, it's like no one had ever said to me, you know, he said to me, you don't need your book. You don't need to make notes of this. He said, if you hear something that's valuable to you, he said, it'll just remember it. You know, you don't need to remember it through writing it down. Every training I'd ever been in, you know, the tra- the instructor starts lecturing and everyone takes out their notebook and puts their head down. No one's looking forward and everyone's just writing in their book the whole time. And that was what I was used to, you know, because I've been in those academic stroke experiential type trainings. And um, it was, I was like, oh, oh, okay. You know, like for some reason, that kind of loving invitation to just allow information to, you know, to be absorbed rather than filtering. And he said, can you just see, can you just not see if this is like something, you know, or to see if it's good or bad or right or wrong, or don't, don't wait for your turn to speak, you know, just let this stuff drift over you. You know, it's kind of like, and an tomorrow or the next day, we'll kind of see what, what, what you still, you know, struggling with. And I don't actually remember what we talked about. I remember one thing about those two days, and it was the question about security. Uh, where does security come from? You know, and uh, everyone kind of like came up with every, He said, you guys have it. There was five of us. You guys have a thing about where security comes from and we'll write it up on the whiteboard, you know? So I did this usual thing that I do. I worked out how much money I needed a month over how many months I figured it would take me to get a new job. You know, that was my belief about security right you know and on investigation the realization everyone came up with a different number i think from the highest was a million mine was like 50k or something you know it's kind of like and uh the realization came that security or in fact any feeling can't come from outside of yourself you know and like that was like a huh interesting you know like i said never looked inwardly like or known how to look inwardly as i said earlier it's kind of like what that actually meant to reflect on my own experience and the creation of my beliefs and understanding of myself and my reflection of the outside world you know sydney banks primary message was that life is an inside out experience not an outside in experience is that everything is happening inside of you and nothing is related to what's happening outside of you everything is thought and perception not not relative to the objective world outside of us, you know, and and that's the realization that I had there. And I think that invitation from Michael, which is what I give to people when they join a group that I run, you know, is kind of like, and and, and another thing that I give is don't listen to my words. And it sounds kind of, if you're turning up where I'm a trainer, you know, it's kind of like, and I'm telling you not to listen to me, sounds kind of counterproductive, but in a way, I'm, I don't want people listening for me to be right and me being the answer and them having the problem. I I want people to see for themselves, look inwardly if what I'm saying resonates with you, look inwardly and see if this holds any value and trust that whatever you see, trust that, you know, because that's what was the invitation that was given to me in those moments. And that is what I think allowed me to just settle down enough to hear something that was priceless, you know. Well, and when you let that in, you know, all of your guardedness was relaxed enough to let it in, then you experienced something different than you'd ever experienced before. And that's where the growth happens. Yeah. Wonderful. So currently, do you run groups through video like this, a long distance? Is it all in person? What's what's the format you're using to engage people? 
Yeah, through Zoom. And I find it's just as effective. I mean, I love face to face. I love being with people too. You know, it's like, but I think since the pandemic, I think long before the pandemic, actually, but the pandemic just cemented it more for other people to be comfortable with it, you know, but um, yeah, through Zoom and like, it's kind of like a, you know, there's some uh, similarities. There's some interesting things that people always look at listening. You know, let's start off with listening. How do we listen? Everyone thinks they're they're a great listener. You know, when you put your hand up, who's a good listener? Everyone goes like this, as I did. You know, it's kind of like, but then we start really talking about listening with nothing on your mind, you know, or, or listening to be impacted. What does it mean to listen to be impacted? What does it mean to listen for something new? You know, not to listen to be right or listen to wait, waiting your turn for the answer or to critically consume and assess information, but just to be present. So I really with a group, you know, really set the scene um, of being relaxed and seeing what it would be to have an insight, seeing what it would be to to see something new, how that might come about, you know, and 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 so on. Like and and really just letting people off the hook, so to speak, from that sort of brain that that we carry around, that guarded mind. Um, and that's not a guarantee of anything, but it just sets the sets the scene, you know, and it sets the you know, it gives people more of a capacity to hear something new, which might be life changing, you know. Um, so yeah, from the, the, there's some stuff like from a group point of view, there's videos and worksheets, and all the worksheets are not reflect, they're not like examinations, they're more like reflective exercises, you know, seeing the role of thought in your own experience, you know, seeing whether anything, a lot of them are kind of questions and scene based, you know, setting a scene for something, and asking people to reflect on it. You know, one uh, one of my favorite ones is about traffic. You know, it's kind of like as an exercise, it's like it sets the scene for two days on the same route to work, uh, both with the same traffic, you know. And um, on one day, you're very stressed, angry, beeping, road rage, pissed off with everyone. You know, it's kind of like your day is ruined. The next day, same traffic, same route, same time, and you're just happy letting everyone in, listening to music. What changes? What's different, you know, it's kind of like, and then people realize, well, it's myself, it's my perception, it's happening within me. And then it clearly points out that the traffic is everything outside of yourself at all times. All of life is just the traffic, you know, it's nothing that it doesn't extend to. So all the exercises are geared towards pointing people inwardly and seeing the role of thought and the role of perception in their experience and, and how the you know, human experience is created within. So I really changing that outward facing, uh, often people are already looking inwardly, but that outward facing, it's my girlfriend, it's my job, it's my life, it's my children. If I could just get the right partner, if I could just get the right job, or if I could stop being let down by friends, you know, we'd move away from that, you know, straight away to what's happening inside of me, you know, and I, particularly like the uh, in my book it's not quite finished but it, it's really about a, it's two parts to recovery what i call recovery now and that is the seeing of the the mind you know what's happening in the mind and the belief based psychological system and also the experience of the body but i don't go too much into trauma first because i want people to see how their own mind exacerbates that you know how their own connection of imaginary dots um, continues to perpetuate the experience of trauma in the body. You know, it's like once people have had that insight into their own beliefs and their own mind and the creation of experience happening within, then we can look at the body, you know, and look at the nervous system and the somatic response to, you know, what, whatever's trauma related, whatever's been stored up from early childhood experiences. So that's kind of, it's not exact, but, and it's non-linear in that some of the teaching points there are some exercises to do, some live groups, some one-to-ones and stuff like that. So how do you get people coming to you? What's what's the source for people becoming aware of your work? Or uh, I've worked in addiction treatment for a long time, so most of the people get kind of referred to me or find me from different social media ways and stuff like that. Um, I, I worked for one of the UK's biggest private addiction treatment companies I actually did their marketing. I wasn't a therapist there, but like I was involved in, 
in a massive sort of job building nine treatment centers across the uk so a lot of people knew me for my addiction work i've i mean it's, it's 29 years for me in recovery as well um so that's kind of yeah i don't know i just think people just appear in my path you know and it, are they mostly people who are working with recovering from addiction or is it just the whole panoply of humans with issues to work out or wanting to have a better life yeah i mean it's I, I can't work with people that require medical intervention you know because they they require further care than i can provide in an online process you know so that's one of my things it's like anyone that requires medical intervention needs to go through that process first um but like it's a whole host of people from struggling with uh hidden addictions you know secret uh things pornography gambling and they they somewhat have a functional life to people that are unfunctional you know struggling with more binge based or um drugs that don't require medical intervention like cannabis for example or something like that um so it's always different you know it's always uh, eating is quite often and common and um debt and money and finances and relationships are very common you know it's like and it's really just seeing you know the first thing i one of the interesting things i get is that people say to me you're the first person that told me i wasn't broken you know you're the first person that told me that what i'm experiencing is a is a normal human response to adversity you know it's like it's my built-in coping mechanism that's just playing out in that way because that's kind of what i help people to see it makes perfect sense if you've had a internal dis-ease to have an external coping mechanism you know that then has been pathologized and turned into a thing and you've been medicated for and you believed has been the source of your problems you know it's kind of like helping people to see that they're okay that actually that coping mechanism is intelligence at work you know yeah absolutely i think it's the the book the darkest well have you been exposed to that one don't, don't know that yeah, i think it's nadine burke harris who was uh a pediatrician that discovered the aces study from back in the 90s yeah and, and she was just amazed that she'd gotten her medical degree and licensed to practice and no one had ever told her about adverse childhood events and the correlations between that and our physical and mental emotional problems later in life yeah and um i know that study yeah i know which yeah. one you mean in the realm of hungry ghosts you're familiar with that book Gabamata, yeah. yeah, it's just yeah. wonderful stuff that's been coming out over the past 20 or 30 years. It really helps people like you get exposed to the idea that whatever we're doing, we've got good reasons for doing. And if we can uncover those reasons, see the dynamics at their core, we've probably developed some experience and wisdom and skills that can allow us to achieve those same goals without having all of the adverse effects. Yeah. One of the things I wrote in my book, you know, man, man is clearly infinitely creative. You know, it's kind of like, I mean, related to this as well, Thomas, you know, Thomas Insel is, he was the director of the National Institute for Mental Health for 15 years in the US. And one of the statements he made, either in his book or in, in uh, the media, was that in $20 billion, all um, they haven't moved the needle in mental health, you know? And, and he was the director of the National Institute for Mental Health, and he, he even said that reality was just a construct, you know? And he said that every other area of science had moved on massively by leaps and bounds, but in mental health, they hadn't even moved the needle. That was his words. And... Um, forgot where I was going to start off with, but like one of my, the things in my book is really about um, helping people to see that, you know, it's kind of like that normal human response to adversity. Oh, that's where I was going. Yeah, so you were give a quote from your book, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, normal human response to adversity. Yeah, I like that saying. It's kind of like normal human response to adversity has been pathologized. Man is infinitely creative because we've created 500 or 600 new talking therapies. It's like, and, and I, I talk about Einstein, you know, it's kind of like 
what if the answer was simple? You know, it's kind of like, but no one's willing to look in that direction of simplicity. You know, it's kind of like, because that wouldn't be conducive with mankind's creative progress. You know, it's kind of like, no one's going to go, hold on a minute. We're looking in completely the wrong direction. Let's look to the simplicity, how the human design is completely perfect, working exactly as it should. You know, it's like, we're never going to look that way. We're just going to keep creating new pro new solutions, problems and solutions. You know, in a way we innocently, you know, no one's got bad intentions. I'm not pointing the finger here. There's no maliciousness going on, but we innocently create and perpetuate the idea and then we find the solution for it, you know, in our system and um, innocent people kind of take that on. You know, I, I'd like to give one little example of that. Like, you know, if you go to like I did, you know, it's like if you have a list of, of symptoms, right? And it's kind of like you go to a, a, a psychiatrist and you say, here's what's happening, you know? And it's kind of like, and they say, well, how long has this been happening? And how intense is this? And what about this thing? What about this thing? And they tick off six of the nine lists out of the DSM diagnosis, you know? And um, and you go away with a medication and a, and a little code against your name, you know, and a label. And it's kind of like, and then you start telling everyone the reason the reason for everything is that, you know, that's the innocence, right? For innocent people, the reason for all these behaviors, the reason for all this suffering, the reason for all these things that have been happening is this thing that I've been told. This label right? and this it's code, right? Yeah, but that was only ever a description. Right. It could never have been a cause because it was only a description of behavior in the first place. It's like, but people really think that that's true. Absolutely. That's one of the flaws, the major flaws of the system. It's like what uh, Krishnamurti and David Bohm would talk about is uh, there's this fundamental flaw in our process of thought as applied to our, our thoughts and emotions. Uh, David Bohm coined the term sustained incoherence, right? We, we do something that doesn't really work and doesn't really make sense. And we think if we just keep doing it more and harder and longer, eventually we'll get a solution. Yeah. Yeah, one of the Einstein quotes was, any fool can make things more complicated, but it takes a touch of genius to make things more simple. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Well, I, I realize we're running up against one of my hard stops here, so I want yeah. you to just uh, uh, take a breath and get centered and think if there's something that we've already talked about that you want to go back and highlight or something we haven't even mentioned yet that you want to put in here, um, what would that be? The one thing I'd love to, I'd love to, people to know if anyone's listening who's suffering or anyone who supports somebody who's suffering, you know, is that I truly believe that because I'd had done so much and been medicated and diagnosed for so long that like, I really thought I was unfixable, that this was all good, what we were talking about here today, but it didn't apply to me. You know, it's kind of like, if you knew how bad I was, if you really had done the things that I'd done, if you'd robbed your own parents, committed the crimes that you'd done, done the horrible things that you felt so full of shame about. Uh, if you'd done those things like me, then you realize that this stuff was great for everyone else. I'd done a few crimes or a little thing or had a little struggle with drugs, but it didn't apply to me. So this, what I'm saying is true for everyone. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. You know, it's kind of like, and, and when you're willing to see that it's not you're not beyond it, you know, the truth of the human experience, the spiritual truth, the innate intelligence, the perfect mental health that's underneath all experience, you know, it's always there if you're willing to look for it. That's the one thing that I would ask people to reflect on, not take my word for, but consider for yourself, you know. Excellent. Well, I deeply appreciate your willingness to share your story with us and the work you're doing. And uh, if people want to get in touch with you, where do you direct them? Um, my addiction program is called infinite recovery project.com. You can find information on it there. Um, my podcast misunderstandings of the mind.com, which is very much spiritual conversations around mental health and stuff uh, on my Web, personal website wideworldcoaching.com you can find me any of those places wonderful well thank you so much for taking the time to be with us thanks Tim it's, a, it's an honor thank you appreciate it Jason Shires is a certified psychotherapist and certified transformative coach who has gone through the full journey 
from childhood trauma to addictions, mental health problems, jails, and psychiatric care, on to a 12-step recovery and becoming a professional helping others. His story is painful and eye-opening. It shows how the system pathologizes normal, intelligent human response to tragic life circumstances. It also shows how there's really a way out for everyone when people learn to discover their own true, natural wisdom. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening. 